Hi, and welcome to Bible Study with Friends. I'm here today with my friend, Ty Esslinger. Hi, Ty. Hey. We are uh, today going to continue our study of 1 Corinthians. And what we're going to be discussing is what compels a Christian? What really motivates a believer? And what should motivate a believer? And this can be applied to our lives, and we can ask ourselves the question, what drives me as a Christian? Does anything drive me as a Christian? Does anything motivate me as a believer? And that's what we're going to be discussing. So stay tuned. Welcome back to Bible Study with Friends. Ty and I are going to be in 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in the ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians. In fact, I hope uh, today that we will finish the chapter 9. Paul, in this next section, is going to talk about how he has decided to set aside his rights for the sake of what compels him. And that's what we're going to talk about today. In verse 15, Paul starts out with the word but. Now, this is in light of verse 14 that says, as I just said, a believing leader has every right to expect to make a living from the gospel. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, Jesus commanded it when he sent out the 12 um, on their missionary journey. But in verse 15, he starts with a but. And the word but is basically, now I'm going to give you a contrast to what I just said. So right. spiritual leaders have a right to expect to make a living from the gospel. But in the same way, he says, I, I have made no use of, of any of these rights. I haven't, in my ministry, demanded the rights that I should be supported by the people I minister to. Mm -hmm. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. And then he goes on and he says, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision from you. So he says, the reason I'm writing this and sharing this with you guys in the Corinthian church is not to make you feel guilty so that you send me money. That's not the purpose of what I'm writing. So when I'm ministering out on the mission field, I don't take money from, I don't insist he'll take money. Uh, people do give him money. But he says, I don't insist on that as part of my rights as a minister. And I'm not writing to you to compel you to make you feel guilty enough to send me money. He says, for I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of ground for boasting. Now, a lot of us will have trouble with that. I know you've looked into that. Does that phrase bother you? Well, when I hear boasting, the very first thing that I think of is um, the less no man boast verse. Right. Right. Which is specifically saying, you know, that, you know, that we shouldn't. So we're getting that in the context of the modern usage for boasting, really. The predominant right. is bragging. Right. Like right? Uh, look look what I have done. Like like yeah. the Pharisee in the in the temple. Remember the Pharisee standing next to the tax gatherer, and the Pharisee was saying, Boy, I, I am great in the church. I do this, I do that. I'm great. I'm not like this sinner, right? He's bragging. Right. Um some of the some of the definitions that I came across was a cause for pride, pride in oneself. Um, and that's the modern usage. It's all, what, it's all self -driven. That's not what the Greek word means, okay? The, the, the word here is glory in. Now, you can glory in it yourself. In right. My favorite couple verses in Jeremiah, Jeremiah uh, 9, 23, and 24 says, don't, don't boast in your wisdom, don't boast in your might, don't boast in your riches. Not what you know, not what you can do, not what you have. And then it says this, but boast in this, that you know God. So it tells you to boast. And the, the word boast is, uh, even in the Hebrew, is to, to glory in. Now, we can glory in self, or we can glory in who gave us what we're rejoicing about. Now, he's yeah. saying, in the context of receiving gifts for ministry, receiving sustenance for ministry. He's basically saying, I'm making no demands 
so that I can give God all the glory. I don't have to give XYZ Church the glory because they wrote me a big check. Uh, but I can glory in the fact that I don't demand payment from anybody, and God, to his glory, provides for me. Now, that is in the context, and he's going to go, he's going to continue on in that same vein of, I don't have to depend upon people I'm ministering to, to provide for me. Yeah, I think what made it hard when I was looking into it was, it says that, like, deprive me of my, like, all these words are very, like, self self-pointing and then you know boasting you think of pride in something of yours i understand right i understand and then but but in the context here he's really talking not about his own ability to raise money or his own ability to uh to suffer and be poor right he's talking about is god has put me in a place where i do not have to demand my rights yeah and because of that i can, can give God glory that he is providing for me and providing for me in that ministry. That is about a blessing to me. Right. But there's nothing wrong with me being blessed in my ministry. It's as long as I don't take credit for it. Right. And when we, when we read, it gives me ground for boasting. We read, it gives me ground for bragging. But really what it says, it gives me grounds for giving glory to the one who provides, because I don't have to ask, I don't have to demand my rights. Yeah. So okay. when I when I found, when I saw like me and my and all all of those sure. things, like I was a little surprised when I looked up the Greek word and its primary usage in the in the Bible, from what I can tell, is more often uh, rejoicing. Yeah. Literally, what he's saying is, n- not demanding my rights gives me the blessing of rejoicing in what God is doing. So I don't have to yeah. demand my rights. And it yeah. gives me a blessing. Well, there's nothing wrong with me receiving a blessing for ministering. There's nothing wrong with me receiving the blessing of money from ministering. Nothing wrong with that. Jesus commanded yeah. that in verse 14. But he says, I, I've chosen to not exercise those rights, and I've gotten this great blessing from it, that I have this grounds for rejoicing and for giving glory that I don't have to demand money to live. So in the context, we've got to take this as a positive thing. In fact, there's another place that Paul talks about boasting. And he says, I boast in you, in your lives. And that's the same, that's the same word there. He says, I'm basically giving glory and, and praise because what God is doing in your life through me. It's not bragging. It's giving glory and rejoicing. And so, and you discovered that when you looked into that, the, that word. Yeah. But it's very key here that I have every right to be provided for, and I have every right to personally be blessed in ministry. When somebody sends me a gift, we have people that, that support us on a monthly basis and some people who just send us gifts. What a blessing that is. Wow. You know, in fact, there's a little button up in the, in the corner that says uh, donate to Lynn or support Lynn. And, and that's great because that shows people want to be on the ministry team and they want to support us. And that is a blessing to us personally. And that's a point of rejoicing and boasting in the Lord that he's given me a ministry that people want to support. So that's yeah. this contrast. I don't make a demand. But, oh, man, I'm blessed that God still provides me, even though I'm not not making demands. And he continues on in that same vein, and it gets clearer as he goes. He says, in verse 16, he says, for, and that the word for, I really don't like that word, because the the translators could very easily put in because, as the reason for, right? All right. I would rather die than than have anyone say, I'm supporting you. He said, I'd rather die than have anyone deprive me of the boast that God is providing for me, mm-hmm. that joy. And then he says, because if I preach in a, in a real sense, and this is the verse, I've got it underlined in red here, because it is a verse that really spoke to my heart. He says, if I preach the gospel, and he does preach the gospel, obviously. So this is, he's setting up this point. If right. I preach the gospel, that gives me no grounds for boasting. In other words, I can't even praise God 
for sharing the gospel. Why? He says, for necessity is laid on me. And I love the way the New American Standard puts it. He says, because I, I'm under compulsion to share the gospel. I have, I've got to share the gospel. It's not something I do that's special. It's something I do because I'm a believer. And this helps us answer the question, what compels us as Christian? What is our motivation? What what runs our lives? It should be to show and grow the idea of becoming a believer and the benefits of being a Christian. Your spiritual conversations with your co-workers you've shared before. That's yeah. a blessing because you are exercising this compulsion to share with them what Christ has done in your life. Same reason we share with our family and friends that don't know Christ. We, we need we need to share with them. Now, if, we, if we're sitting, if we're a Christian and we say, ah, I just go to church and I just enjoy my, the, the music and the message. You see where we're not feeling the compulsion of the need to share Christ with the people around us who are lost. Yeah. And in my case, early on, you know, I had this really funny feeling. I, I enjoyed teaching the scriptures. And I enjoyed discipling people and, and leading people to Christ. And it, it, it kind of was saying, you know, why do I do that? And if I moved or if I went to a different church or whatever, I was constantly looking for opportunities to meet with guys, to uh, do Bible studies with, with people, to lead um, uh, small groups, to, to be involved in teaching. Because that was my spiritual gift. And under that spiritual gift, I'm under a compulsion to minister. Mm -hmm. And that's what Paul is saying. He says, for necessity is laid on me. I have got to minister. And he says, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. And that's the same for me. If I'm not, if I'm not proclaiming the gospel, if I'm not discipling people, I go nuts. Uh, it, it really damages me to not be exercising my spiritual gift. Uh, Paul was an evangelist. Uh, I'm a mm -hmm. teacher. You could have the gift of service in the church where you just go, I just don't feel right if I'm not serving somewhere or if I'm not teaching somewhere or if I'm not helping somebody, if I'm not doing my administrative role or my janitorial role, whatever it is, I might be and should be under some kind of spiritual necessity to do that to serve the Lord so that I can give him glory for it. And if he, he goes on in verse 17, I love this. He says, for if I do this ministry of my own will, I have a reward. In other words, if I just decide I, I need to teach, I have a reward in that I get to teach. And he mm -hmm. says, but if not of my own will, if I do it because I have to, because I have to obey, I'm commanded to teach or I'm commanded to share the Lord. And if I do it, if I do it freely, that's great. But if I do it out of obedience, because I need to do it, he says, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. And that's this, that's this, I still have a job to do. Sometimes I do that job uh, joyfully. Uh, sometimes uh, it's it's just a thrill to do, and other times m ministering is is work, and I don't feel like it. But there are times when I have to do it just because I'm under a compulsion to do it, and I need to obey. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we get we as Christians can ask ourselves some some difficult questions in that: Is there any spiritual thing in my life that I'm just under a compulsion to obey that I have to do it? whether I feel like doing it or not feel like doing it, it's just something God has put on me that I need to obey him and do it. And if we say there's nothing in my life like that, then I think that's a matter of really going to the Lord and asking him for what are my spiritual gifts, have somebody indicate what my spiritual gifts are. And if I don't know, and nobody has told me what my spiritual gifts are, I need to start doing things in the church to find out. I didn't know my right. spiritual gift was teaching until I taught. And had people come and say, boy, that was, that was such a blessing. That really ministered to me. Uh, you have the gift of spiritual teaching. And, and I went, really? You know, that's kind of weird because 
I've never been able to teach anything else. <laughs> but, but that verifies. And all of a sudden, God gives you a gift and says, now, buddy, uh, I've gifted you. I've equipped you. You need to do this in your Christian life. So we, we can ask the question, what compels us as Christians? Sharing the gospel, giving our testimony, absolutely. Uh, teaching the word of God, absolutely. Serving in the church, absolutely. Serving each other, uh, loving each other, absolutely. And we do that sometimes out of obedience and sometimes out of joy. And that's, that is a real insight into Paul. And he goes on, he says in verse 18, what then is my reward? That in my preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge. In other words, I know I'm doing the right thing so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. So it's a blessing to me to be able to just do what I do. It's a blessing to us. I don't have to have people send me money. It's a blessing when they do. Don't get me wrong. But I don't have to. And it's great to have a ministry outlet where I can teach, put it on YouTube. And I've done things like I've made resources available and tried to sell them. And it was great because I made some money. Uh, but it just felt funny. And God did not necessarily bless the amount of money that came in. I, I, I made a little money. But all of a sudden, I thought, you know what I should do is I should give these resources free and let uh -huh. God provide the money by putting on people's hearts to send me money, to give us gifts. In fact, I, got a, I have a friend right now. We are not a 501c3 ministry. But I have a friend right now who called me and said, you know, uh, why aren't you a ministry? Why aren't you a 501c3 so we can have deductible gifts? And I said, well, I can't afford the lawyer and I can't afford all the paperwork and all that's involved. I've been told uh, that it's a fairly expensive situation and I just can't afford it. I just on my income, I just don't have the money. And he said, I'm going to take care of that for you. And he start, and now he's investigating how we can be a, a ministry. That's a blessing. Huge. Yeah. Is he called me out of the blue? I didn't have to do a solicitation and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, you with me? But yeah. Uh, what were we going to say? But Paul at this point is a bivocational because he's working as a tent maker, right? Right. But that that's not always the case. He does move to full time, right? Yes. But he when he goes to full time, it's because the church has decided to support him. It's not because he comes in and says, OK, I'll minister. What's my salary? Right. He never does that. But he comes in. Some of the churches that he ministers in are very wealthy churches. Ephesus is a very wealthy church when he establishes it. And the people there supply his needs. They supply him with housing. They supply him with food. He talks about going to people's houses for dinner. But, but, he, but he never makes a demand for it that for me to come, it's right. going to cost X. Right. I contacted a guy, a, a great Christian musician called Phil Kagey. He's a, he's a great musician. In fact, I use his music uh, as a music bed in, in I've Been Thinking and in Bible Study with Friends. And I contacted Phil one time about doing a concert. And he said, yeah, I'd be happy to come and do a concert at your church. And I said, well, what are your fees? And he says, no, I come, I come on, a, on an offering basis, just whatever people want to give me. I don't make a demand of a certain fee. And I, so I was talking to him and I said, well, uh, how much would it cost me to be able to use your music on my website? And he's, he's got, I mean, he's a big star. He's, he's got albums. He does tours. I mean, he's, right. he, he's a big star. And he said, just, he said, you feel free to use my music as long as you say I've given you permission to use it. So down in the description below, I say, Thanks, Phil Kagey, for providing music. But that's this idea. We have, a, we have a right to make a living from our ministry. But it's a blessing to be able to be in the position where we can minister. And sometimes we minister and they say, hey, if you come to our church, we're going to give you X amount of money. That's great. But that's not a demand. of That's my minimal fee. You see what I'm saying? Right. Right. Uh, now, I, 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 I'm not going to argue with, with artists who have a minimum fee. Uh, I just, I'm not going to, but I think they're missing out on a blessing that God can provide for them even beyond the minimum fee. Okay. 
Yeah. And I think that's what Paul was talking about in his ministry. So we could ask ourselves in our Christian life, what is it that God has given me that I've just got to do? Teaching, service, uh, evangelism, whatever. I've known friends who, are, who have the gift of evangelism. Man, they, they witness like breathing, and they just got to do it. And if they don't do it, it's like holding their breath. You know, it's just, this, they just go, this is not right. I got to have to do this. And I feel the same way about teaching. That's what a, what a blessing being locked in the basement and quarantine. <laughs> and, and, and still, because of Zoom, I meet with six, eight, ten people a week. What a great thing that technology has blessed us with. Yeah. And I do this. Zoom costs me some, some money. A Christian friend said, look, let me take care of that for you. And he gives me money that takes care of the fees for Zoom so that I can have Zoom with more than one person. So what a blessing, right? Now, yeah. if we go on to the next verse, verse 19 says, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all. He says, because I haven't asked for any money, I come into town and I'm not required to go somewhere because of the money. Right. So I'm, I'm free from that. He says, but I've made myself a servant to all. And by saying just, I'm coming, I'm coming to your group just to serve you. And that's, that's blessing. That's ministry. That's a place where I can give God glory. He's put me in a place where I can come and offer on YouTube these video, these Bible studies for free. I don't have to do a think if it course where it's, I have to, I, you know, tried that. God said, basically, put it on for free. Okay. Now he says, verse 19. I have made myself a servant of all that I might win more of them. And you, you know, people like this, somebody comes in and uh, they go, Oh, how much money is he going to ask from me? They got their hand firmly clamped on their, their wallet and don't be asking me for money. That's why pastors have, have a hard time teaching on money because they should teach on money. Jesus commanded that people give, but pastors have a hard time because there are groups of people and pastors want to be free. To be able to say, look, I'm just teaching you this. I remember in a church, I was a member of a church, and the pastor would ask me to preach and say, would you mind filling the pulpit? I was a business guy. He said, would you mind filling the pulpit for me? And I said, sure, you, you're going to be out of town? He says, no, no, I'm just going to be in the audience, me and my wife, and we'll just do that. I said, well, man, I'd be, I'd be thrilled to do that. And he said, now, could you teach on giving? <laughs> because now I was a guy in the church who gave, and I'm, I get to share about giving, not from the thing of getting me anything, but getting a thing of this is good teaching to support that guy. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, Paul is saying, but since I don't do that, I'm free. And then he goes into a very interesting little section. And I want to cover this very quickly just to clarify this. He says, to the Jews, I became a Jew as a Jew in order to win Jews. Now, he doesn't go back to practicing but he became like a Jew in order to win Jews. He, he had no problem going with somebody and saying, I'm going to respect your, your traditions. I'm going to respect the way you eat. I'm going to respect the way you live. And I'm going to be there with you in that to win you for Christ. Mm -hmm. And then to those under the law, I became as one under the law. That's the Jews. He says, so if I came on Sabbath and we wash uh, before we eat, uh, I'll do that. I, I no problem for the purpose of winning that Jewish person to Christ. Right. This isn't being false. This is having a a motivation for why I do what I do. Something something similar is um, it's surprising to me how one way a lot of uh, conversations can can be like uh i've i've been with people that um they'll they'll have a random gospel conversation right and it, the the two people are just talking at each other right like one person's giving their reasons for why they aren't a christian and they're just talking at the christian and the christian isn't listening and the christian is talking at the unsaved as to why they should be saved and they're not listening. Right. And it's just like, you can get so much farther with people 
by listening and pointingly responding to stuff that is personal to them. Right. And that's not saying that you're condoning or agreeing with what they're saying. It's exactly right. Exactly right. Let me make a point of this. Basically what Paul is saying is, says, when I'm going in to reach a group, whoever that group is, I want to relate to that group where they are. Right. And that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah. I remember I, my wife and I had a, uh, had a Hindu couple uh, in, in Chattanooga that we were, we were ministering to. We wanted to reach with the gospel. And we invited them over to our house. And it was the first Western house they'd ever been invited to. And they'd never eaten a meal with Europeans or with white people. Right. With Americans. Never even been in an American house before. Uh, which that kind of was weird because they'd lived in Chattanooga for quite a while. <laughs> but we invited him to our house. And he said, now, look, we're Hindu and we're vegetarian. We don't eat meat. And I said, not a problem at all. And we had a vegetarian meal. Um, yeah. You know, a, a vegetarian chili and corn on the cob and, you know, just the, and it was really funny because they came over and they took pictures of the food and sent a text to their mother and father in India saying, we're, we're at an American house and we're eating vegetarian food that we can eat. And all I was doing was in an attempt to share the gospel in a loving way, I was meeting them where they were. I was a vegetarian as they were a vegetarian. And that's what Paul's talking about here. Right. We need to be very careful to talk with somebody and not at somebody. And that's what Paul is talking about. He says, he says, to those outside the law, he says, so now in verse 21, to, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. And then he makes sure that you understand. He didn't say, I, I became outside the law. So talking to Gentiles. He says, yeah. I became as one outside the law. And then he goes, not being outside the law of God myself, but under the law of Christ. So I'm doing this, I'm relating to people because I'm under a compulsion to share with them and teach them, but I want to do it in a way that relates to them and, he, and shows that I am concerned about them and where they are. Right. Well, that's a great picture of a ministry, of really paying attention to who we're trying to reach, who we're trying to be. If I've got a guy that, that his hobby is motorcycles, I'd like to be able to relate to his motorcycle interest or to whatever interest. Now, obviously, well, if the guy's into pornography, I don't want to relate to that. Right, but I, I do gonna... want to relate to who he is, where he's at, what his struggles are. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna make the example of you don't want to relate with a drunk by being a heavy drinker with. But I might, I might relate to a drunk by going to the bar where he's at. Right. And having him not encouraging him to drink, but having him while I share the advantages of Christ to that. And this is what he's talking about in verse 22. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. In other words, there's no group that I will not relate to in order to, ex to have them accept Christ as their Savior. I may not join with them in their sin, but I'm going to relate to them. Yeah, you need to be careful that there's no group that you feel so strongly against that you don't want to relate with them. Well, and that's where I may hate the sin, but I don't hate the sinner. Right. I know a lot of homosexual people. I, I, I'm, I'm friends with, I've worked with homosexual people. Now, I don't like the homosexuality because that's clearly in the scripture sin. But I don't say, sorry, I can't talk to you because you're a homosexual or you're gay. No. I want to be a friend. I want to relate to them life to life. Now, if they want to flirt or do the things like that, I no, 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 I'm not in doing that. But as a person, I'm going to relate to them so that I can win them to Christ. Right. And that's where he is. To the weak, if it's an alcoholic and I'm weak in this area, I'm going to understand that. And that, that relates back to what he just got done talking in, the, in an earlier chapter about if I'm with a, 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 a person and they can't eat meat because they're weak, 
in that. And if they ate meat, it would cause them to fall. It would cause them to stumble. Well, in that case, I'm going to become weak and say, okay, I, I'm not going to eat meat either. Why? So that I can win them. And then he says this in verse 23, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in the gospel's blessings. I might bring them into the blessings of knowing Christ. Now, what compels us as a Christian? It should be, I want to I want to identify with people in a way that draws them to Christ. I want to minister to them in a way that draws them to Christ. If asking for them to give me a living is in the way, I will give up that right even if I have to suffer for it. See the context? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, let's, let's end there. This is a, a great section of Scripture, and it's a great thing to ask us the question, what motivates us? What compels us in the Christian life? And basically, Paul's answer is, everything in my life is about sharing the gospel in one way or another. The way I conduct business, the way I work at my job, uh, I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer like Ty Esslinger. Well, I want to be a mechanical engineer in a way and talk to my fellow workers in a way that is a spiritual blessing to them, uh, not demanding, not driving them away from the gospel, but relating to them so that I can present the gospel. Because it's all about for sake of the gospel. Amen? Amen. Amen. And I know you from your prayer, from your prayer requests, that that's on your heart all the time. And that's a good thing. Well, let's end here. Thank you guys for watching. Pray, I pray that this was a blessing to you. I'd love to hear your comments. I really would. Hit the like button. That helps us with YouTube and the search engine. But also, I'd love to hear your comments about this issue. What compels you in your Christian life? Now, you might have compulsions as a non-Christian uh, in your life, but I'm talking about as a Christian. Now, if there's nothing, then let's have a conversation. And we'll, we'll address that together. God bless you guys. We will see you next week in 1 Corinthians in, in Bible study with friends. God bless you.